All right, I want to thank everybody for coming out to uh, this town hall. What we did, I am the chair of the Libertarian Party of Duval County, and many of you, most of you probably know that we had three candidates running. They unfortunately did not make it to the general election, but that doesn't mean that we didn't want to keep participating in the community affairs. So what we did was we reached out to every single candidate that is still currently on the ballot somewhere here in Duval, and we invited them to an all candidates town hall. And the candidates that you see before you are the ones who responded that they would be able to make it. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get any of the others, but that's okay because we have a great lineup here and we've got some great questions and hope that you enjoy it and then hope the candidates are able to get their message out as Tub was talking about a moment ago. So the format that we're gonna go have tonight is we'll start very simple. We'll have a minute and a half open and where did Eric go? I lost, the, there he is. So Eric's gonna be our timer, so just kind of keep an eye on him and he'll kind of wave and uh, let you know when your one and a half minutes is up. That will also be the same amount of time for all of the questions that we ask as we go through. And then eventually we will have some questions from the audience. So with that, let me get out of the way and we will start from left to right. And I don't know if Tub explained this, but the way that we're going to do this is we'll start, we'll go left to right and we will uh, start with each, how do you say this? Each, uh, the, the person to your left will be the person to start on the next round. So uh, Mr. Gay, you'll start um, with the, uh, the, the opening and then on the first question, we'll go with uh, Ms. Holly and then continue on down the way. So one and a half minutes and you don't have to wait for me, just keep right on going. Well, good evening, I'm Mike Gay. I'm running for City Council District 2, and I'm the people's candidate of our community. I've entered this race as a uh, lifelong resident of our community that can sit here and be quiet no more. And I'm going to take my talent, skills, and abilities that I've learned and obtained over 33 years of being in business. And, you know, being in business, we never go to work. We never go in business to be broke. We never go to, to not to prosper. And I've prospered. And I've learned how to take that abilities and that prosper to go down to city council and to watch your dollar. See, I understand the value of a dollar, but I also understand the value of your dollar. And I will place a high emphasis on what we spend and make sure we got effective spending and we bring accountability, accessibility, and we bring responsibility and responsible uh, to our growth and our infrastructure out here. The, the, what's going on with development here, it's they're getting a free pass. And something's not just something, there's a lot wrong. And I will bring uh, a watchdog to that to sit here and get our infrastructure, get our children, our families, and everything in place that we need a better economy and a better Jacksonville. Mike Gay, City Council District 2. And before the rest of you go, I just want to interject one thing. We did promise the church, you didn't make any, uh, nothing on you just before we get into it. Please refrain from using any personal religious views here. Uh, the church has asked us to refrain from that. So when you give your answers, thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, first, to the Libertarian Party of Duval County for hosting us and having us here today. I am Tamika Gaines Holly, candidate for City Council District 8. Born and raised in Jacksonville, grew up on the north side in District 8, and I continue to live in the new District 8. Of course, many of us were, were affected by the redistricting. Uh, I was not, fortunately. <laughs> so I remain in District 8. Um, again, graduated from Reball High School, and went on to Florida A&M University, came back to Jacksonville and began working uh, with Mayo Clinic. And soon thereafter was recruited to work in the nonprofit social services uh, organization and was always a personal and professional advocate for communities that had uh, underprivileged, under-resourced and continue to make sure that they receive the resources. Uh, my husband is a retired JSO officer, 25 years. He currently serves in the Florida Air National Guard and we raised our children here. I'm the current chief operations officer for Elder Source and we provide 
services to seniors and those persons living with disabilities. I am looking to be your choice for change. We have had long time had those who have not done the right things for our communities, make sure the resources come to us so that we can have great quality of life. And I want to be that courageous ca candidate for you to be able to be your voice on city council and make sure that we do receive those resources. Tamika Gain Tali, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Raymond Day. I'm a candidate in District 11, which is way on the southeast corner of Duval County. There are 10 members of the Libertarian Party who are registered to vote in District 11. So for me to come all this way for 10 voters, you know I'm interested in everything that every voter uh, has uh, their concerns. Uh, I am a fifth generation Floridian, born in Madison County, raised here in Jacksonville since the age of three, graduate of Terry Parker High School, Jacksonville University, where I received my bachelor's degree and a master of business administration from the University of Florida. Most of my career has been in the corporate world, banking, mortgage lending, commercial real estate. I took two sabbaticals of what I call public service. I was chief of staff to Congressman Charles Bennett from 1986 to 1988. He was known as uh, the people's watchdog, fiscal responsibility. I learned those lessons from Charlie Bennett. I also took another sabbatical. I went back to my high school alma mater, Terry Parker, and I taught for three years. So I have given back to the community. I'm currently vice president of acquisitions for Hakimi and Holdings. We're a family-owned investment company. I am running for safe neighborhoods, smart growth, fiscal responsibility, good human services, and neighborhood fairness. I welcome your questions. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Draper. I'm a candidate for a district that is way away from here, District uh, 14. It's the new District 14. And I've lived in that area for almost 40 years. I am happy that we had the, the redistricting that we ended up with. It created a, a nice, even, compact district that we, we will represent well. The things that need to be done, especially when you're running for a district council seat, is the meat and potatoes issues. Things like police protection, roads, basically trash pick, making sure, sure that the services that the city government offers are evenly and properly administered. Roads and police protection are the top priority. Now you throw in parks, trying to keep the crime down, you encourage youth athletics, so youth parks, increase police protection and roads. That is what I'm campaigning on, and I look forward to representing District 14. I'm John Draper, thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Rockman Johnson, and I too am running to represent you on District 14 for the Jacksonville City Council. And let me tell you, the reason why I'm running is because we need difference in diversity on the council. As I told my, my friend and my opponent, John Draper, I'm going to outwork you, but then I'm going to turn around and work with you because we've got to work together for a better Jacksonville. Uh, I am, I've been, I was born and raised here in Jacksonville like Miss Gaines Holly. I went to Rebaul Senior High School or Jean Rebaul, as we are told it must be called. Uh, I went to undergrad at Edward Waters University where I have degrees in uh, mass communications and political science. Uh, my master's degrees are in strategic communications and global leadership from Seton Hall University. And I'm currently a PhD candidate at Jackson State University. Now I tell you all that not to say I'm so educated that I don't know a whole lot, but I am willing to learn and willing to listen. Uh, I'm currently, uh, after spending years as a news anchor reporter, yes, another news anchor is trying to run for political office in Jacksonville, but I've been involved in the community all my life. And so this is not new for me, it's just taking my storytelling to a different level. Um, 
Currently, I'm a professor of journalism and communications at Edward Waters University, which is a full circle moment for me because that's where I went to school. And so it's an honor to be able to find ways that we can bring innovation. The three things I'm really talking about in this campaign, number one, is to deal with infrastructure. Infrastructure meaning roads in our community, meaning, um, oh, that's my 130. We're going to talk about it. I look forward to your questions. I got some amazing ideas that I want to share for our district. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Good afternoon. How are you? How are we? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first off, Tamika, I need to get that uh, fanny pack next time. All right. That's that's I like that. I like that. I'm Charles Garris. I'm for at large group five. I apologize for my appearance. I just came. I've been uh, canvassing over here since 10 a.m. So I'm a little tired, uh, but um, I'm running because I'm tired of hearing about our potential. How many times have you heard the word potential? Jackson has so much potential. Well, what, what's been going on for the last 20 years that we've been hearing that word, right? Nothing. Um, I have a vision to create a safe, welcoming, and vibrant city. And the way we're going to get there is by investing back into our city, back into our infrastructure, like Rockman was talking about, back into our neighborhoods, turning our neighborhoods, which are just a, really just a collection of buildings, into communities, thriving communities, and then our people. Uh, people talk about let's be able to recruit the best businesses, the best people here. How about let's focus on the people that we have here right now first, right? Um, we'll talk more. Uh, I am a veteran, Florida Army National Guard. Um, uh, I currently serve on the Jacksonville Environmental Protection Board, where I chair the Water Committee, uh, and I serve on uh, the Board of Directors for Changing Homelessness, where we are working every single day to end uh, homelessness here in Jacksonville. Um, so I'm looking for the rest of the forum. Thanks so much. All right, thank you for all, for, thank you candidates for all those uh, openings. So I wanna get right into this. And one of the things that I love doing is holding people accountable. But in order to hold them accountable, you have to have something specific for which to hold them accountable for. Now, you're not yet on city council. So the question is, if elected, by the time your term is up, how should the citizens of Jacksonville judge you? What will be the measure of success for you during your term? And we'll, we'll start here with uh, Ms. Holly. Thank you, great question. Um, because I, the big A word scares a lot of people because that means that they have to do something, yeah. right? Yeah. So what people can hold me accountable for after four years is that they were able, I was accessible. That means that you first gotta show up. I'm the only one here for District 8. <laughs> so check, I'll show up, right? So that's the, you know, and then and the next thing is, is that I will listen. We, we will have the conversation. I'm not saying we will agree, but I will listen. You will have the audience to be able to share with me what your concerns are, and I'll listen. And number two, I'll be transparent. I will make sure that you know what I'm thinking, what I know, you know. What, what, what I don't know, you'll help me know. So for me, like I said, I can, we can't talk about, I can tell you what I, what I will do specifically on issues, but that's the way I will be as a representative. I will make sure I show up, I'm accessible, that I am open, I am transparent, and I will listen to the concerns of those that I represent. Well, I can tell you that at the end of my eight years, uh, I will have accomplished this. Number one, I'm a member of the True Commission. It's a city commission that studies city finances. I did research into the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Today, we are 765 police officers short. I introduced the True Commission adopted unanimously my plan to hire 148 officers each year over the next eight years. On average, it will cost about $16.8 million per year over the eight years, from 14.8 up to about 18.8. At the end of the eight years, we will have a fully funded sheriff's office. We will be at the same level of staffing in the sheriff's office as our four large urban peer cities, Miami, Tampa, Orlando, and St. Petersburg. That is my number one priority. 
I'm the only candidate running for city council in any district citywide who has passed a plan to fully fund the police. That is my number one priority. And that is the reason that one of my Republican competitors has now endorsed me to represent District 11. This is the fourth candidate forum that I've attended. And I'm the only candidate who has been to all four. Uh, the other candidate who will be on the ballot with me has never attended a public forum. Thank you. Well, if four or eight years from now, as a former councilman, I understand what it takes to accomplish things in with city government. My number one priority is to get Old Middleburg Road widened. It is a horrible road now. It was a beautiful two-lane country road to a dead end for most of the time I was in Jacksonville. But then Oakley was built and it is now a super highway. But the problem was that it was included in the Better Jacksonville plan, but then the money was siphoned off for the courthouse. And so Old Middleburg Road has been 20 years behind being widened. Now, if I can accomplish that and I can accomplish widening Rampart Road and then working on uh, Collins Road, those I will view as being a success. Making sure the parks have decent restrooms. All I ever hear from the athletic folks is that their restrooms, it takes months to get restrooms repaired. Those are bread and butter issues, meat and potato issues that people have to deal with every day. And then of course, making sure we have enough police officers to, to keep the community safe. Those are the things that after four years or after eight years, I will be proud to have, have accomplished. I'm really thankful to have this opportunity to represent our city on city council. And I'm happy that uh, my opponent here, Mr. Draper, had the opportunity to represent the city before. And I'm looking forward to look at some of the things he did in the past so that we can move forward into the future. And that's what this campaign is about. Uh, accessibility, uh, as Ms. Gaines Holly said, is something that I'm sure that we want all of our elected officials to be, but we also have to do things that are connecting. Not, you know, a lot of times we as city councils, uh, council people, once we are elected, will get there and we are so district centric that we forget that in order for anything to get done, you really do need 10 votes. So what we need to do is be working for the betterment of Jacksonville about relationships, not it's a, potholes and street lights do not have party affiliations. So we've got to work across lines and create relationships. So when there's an issue in District 14, then I can reach out to my councilwoman or councilman from other districts across the city and we work together on making Jacksonville better. Because when there's an issue in New Berlin, guess what? Eventually I'm gonna feel it on the west side. So what's important is that we create relationships and that's one thing I wanna be judged on. I wanna be judged in eight years after serving you on city council for saying that, you know what? He didn't look at black or white. He didn't look at these areas and specific issues in that area or for certain people. He looked at what can make Jacksonville better. And that's what I'm looking to do on the council. So all y'all, will be mine and, and our bosses, right? I'm not the one ultimately that's going to be telling you how you should judge me. It's y'all who be telling me what I need to be doing, right? And so city council, our, you know, we pass legislation, we pass a budget. You know, when you look at it, and we have almost limitless power when it comes to what we can pass, right? And so if you've ever heard in the past from a city council person, oh, well, we can't do that, we can't do this, that's crap. Because if you have an issue, there's a way to solve it some way, right? And um, as Tamika was talking about, um, if they're not here now before they're elected, are they going to be there for you when they are elected? No, no, right? Um, and so, like I said, I want to create a safe, welcoming, and vibrant city. 
And that is what I hear as I'm going out. This isn't just something I pulled, you know, hey, this sounds nice and sounds pretty. Um, but this is what I'm hearing as I, again, I'm running citywide, the entire county. Every single person in here, if you live in Jackson, will be able to vote for me. And that is what I hear from everyone. Safety, their infrastructure, daily flooding, transportation issues, vibrancy. You want to do something on the weekend with your kids. You can't because there is nothing to do hardly anymore. Um, and welcoming. You know, it, it, this is what we want to do. We want to build a better city for everyone. And one last second. I want you to be able to call me and say, hey, this is what I want. And we're going to make it happen. If I'm not doing that, then yes, vote for the next guy. At the end of uh, the, the term, I would only hope that my determination, my due diligence, that the people will be able to see, just like they see in Al Ferreira, that this guy represented the people. This guy was a voice of the people. He wasn't owned by the establishment. He wasn't owned by the, the, the well-to-do and the special interest that when it come time to deal with Khan in the stadium, he stood up for the people, that he stood up for what's our return on investment for the people? What, what did he do to and sit here and make a better Jacksonville, but also didn't break the Jacksonville people purses and piggy banks? That the, the look upon me, the legacy upon me is that, that – no, I'm not going to sit here and make promises other than I will fight for you relentlessly. I will watch your dollar just like it was my dollar, that I will be a diligent servant of the people. I will be accessible. I will be here to fight with you when the developers come in to try to ravish more land out on Black Hammock Island. I will be there to say no. That And yes, and we, I would hope and I would pull from all the at-large councilmen Come on, let's get on board because they represent you too. So, thank you. All right. Thank you for all those answers. So we've heard some comments related to infrastructure. And one of the things that's pretty big in Jacksonville is the stadium. And it's not really going to – like there, there is a certain level of financial obligation that's not going away without a huge debate. So let's set that aside and the question that I have is what would you do or what are your thoughts regarding potential upgrades that may come about during your term? To the, to the stadium. Correct, upgrades. Okay. And then, yes, go ahead. Right. I, I view the Jacksonville Jaguars as the greatest economic development engine in this city. We get invaluable publicity every time there's a game. We went to the playoffs we were on national, we were on international exposure. Every time we play a game in London, the whole world is watching. We could never afford to get that kind of publicity for this city. Since 1993, this city has grown about 25%. I think you can directly attribute much of that growth to the presence of the fact that we are in an NFL city. We are a world-class city. We are only going to become more so. Right now, Jacksonville is growing at 2% a year. That means every year, 20,000 new people are coming into Jacksonville. The secret is out. We're going to continue to grow. So uh, I support upgrades to the stadium. You know, somebody said we probably could build a brand new stadium for maybe 50% or 75% more than the upgrades would cost. I think we need to look at all of that because I view that as long-term investment in our public facilities. So I'm willing to be open-minded about upgrades to the stadium, whatever that might be, because I do believe it is absolutely essential that we maintain this team in the city of Jacksonville. If you've been watching since Thursday night, we've had a tremendous draft experience, and I think we're going to see that continue in the future. Yes, the Jacksonville Jaguars have become an integral part of this city. There's a lot of fans, a lot of interest, and it's, as Raymond said, it gives us uh, 
invaluable publicity all over the world. The problem is that we have to, to uh, balance that with other needs. I, I floated the idea of a referendum for the, for the upgrades. Maybe that's possible. I have to sit down with the finance people and see if, if uh, we can put it on the ballot and make sure the people are involved because it's going to be a stunning amount of money that they're asking for. And I'm not sure where the city government's going to get that money when you add in all these other upgrades, all these other needs of neighborhoods. I, I really enjoy the Jaguars. I want them to stay. But we have to look very hard at how we're going to fund a, a stadium improvement. The, the unspoken threat is that they'll leave if we don't do what they ask. And I want to do it. I just don't know quite yet how we're going to pay for it when you balance that against infrastructure and um, other needs. So we'll see. I look forward to having that discussion with the finance people and uh, as a councilman. The interesting part here is with the stadium, it is an integral part, as was said earlier, a major economic engine for this city. But the stadium is owned by the city. So if we don't fix the stadium that we owned, we are essentially slumlords. And one of the things that I will not do is allow our city to be able to or to allow that stadium to fall into disrepair. Uh, I think it's important. And when you look at the stadium and look at the opportunities that it could bring to this city, we're thinking about world class concerts, other entertainment venues, which brings culture to this city. But that is, again, a part of the economic engine that allows Jacksonville to move forward. So we cannot afford not to upgrade the stadium. Furthermore, I don't even understand how we could talk about referendums when you've elected 19 people to sit on the city council to make these decisions. Why would I spend half a million dollars for me not to do my job? The, the referendum is going to cost at most half a million dollars and probably more dollars that could be used for other things. You've elected us to do the work. You will have elected us to go in and do all of the information that's needed. So what I believe is that it's our job to share with you the information that we learn, to get the information that we can, but to do what we can to push Jacksonville forward. I believe that if we invest a certain amount of money now, 10 years down the road plus, we will look back and say this decision has made Jacksonville a better place and a more habitable place. So short answer is yes. Um, I do support uh, the upgrades and as Rock was saying, I mean, it's, it's our stadium. This, we, we own it, right? And, um, but I will say, uh, when it comes to negotiating and, and you know, uh, the, as I say, well, if you don't, well, then we'll, we'll leave. Bull crap. I, I, I don't play that game. You know, serving on the, the Jackson Environmental Protection Board, uh, we hear different variances, and uh, Amazon came in front of us saying, hey, we need this variance, uh, and if you don't uh, give us, approve this variance, we're just going to take this uh, warehouse facility uh, to Georgia. And I said, that's not how we play this game. You're not going to come up here and threaten me to try to get what you want out of it, right? Uh, show me how this will benefit us and everything else, and let's talk through it. Not a, you know, you don't start negotiations out like that. Um, so we have to, we are up here when we're elected, we are here to protect our dollars, we all pay taxes up here. We are here to protect our dollars. But we also, like I said, I want a vibrant Jacksonville. I want a welcoming Jacksonville. Yes, and yes, let's support the upgrades uh, for the stadium. But what else? We have infrastructure issues. We have neighborhood issues. We have many other issues across the 850 square miles of Duval that also need to be fixed. And so it's not just let's blow the whole kitty on the stadium, but we also need to continue to focus on the rest of the city. Yes, I support the going in and renovating a stadium, but I don't support just throw, giving them an open checkbook. You know, we need accountability. We need to sit here and see what the, the Jaguars are willing to commit to, uh, uh, to partnership with us. 
you know, the Jaguars, the brand, you know, that's owned by the NFL. It's not owned by the Jaguars. So, you know, we got to have these commitments that, you know, moving forward that, you know, we need some assurance, uh, long-term goals, and then uh, basically what, what's going on like with Daly's Place down there now. Every time there's an event at Daly's Place, it costs the city of Jacksonville money. We're not making any money on Daly's Place. The one that's making money is Con down there on Daly's Place. So it's a little a little more in, uh, intricate of what, what's going on there. So we really got to have everything put in order before we, we move forward with it. But yes, I'm all for about progress, but we need to be progress with a purpose and the purposes of the people. We need to sit here and have a better Jacksonville, but we also need to have a better way of life throughout Jacksonville. Agree. I agree with a lot that has been said. Jack, the Jaguars were one of the one of the the only things that really brought this city together in, in the last eight, 18 months, really. So of course there is a value that the Jaguars bring to Jacksonville. So we want to be able to keep that, but at what cost? That's the question. And for me, I am go I am a fiscally responsible person. So I want to know what is the return on the investment? What can the people of Jacksonville in, in expect with any type of investment that we give? Those things got to match. And we need to make sure that they do. And if they don't, and we, can, we don't know, again, there is an, you know, an intangible with the, the excitement that we, that we experienced during the time of going to, to the playoffs and, and prayerfully to a Super Bowl. So we, we, we will make a, a count for that. But we also need to know that there are hard dollars that we're being asked to put into this to this project, into the stadium, which is our asset. However, we want to make sure before I decide to make a decision, what can the people of Jacksonville expect with this type of investment? And so with that, that's the way I would look at the issue and how I would address it. Um, but ultimately, I do want to see the upgrades to the stadium happen, but not at the highest cost. All right, thank you very much for those answers. Let's move on to something in infrastructure that I think is a little bit more impactful to people in their day-to-day -day lives, and that would be drainage. And we can see that it's looking like it might rain, so it might even impact people here within the next few hours. So how would you address drainage issues throughout the city of Jacksonville? And I believe Mr. Draper, we'll start with you. Well, drainage is the a uh, perennial issue. I, drainage was a big issue 30 years ago when I ran the first time to be on the city council, and it continues to be. And it really comes down to an attitude. Uh, many people just say drainage, you spend all this money, you dig a hole, you put the pipes in, you cover up, it's gone. Nobody knows it's there. It doesn't do anything. Except if you live in the area where it floods. And that's, that's the tough part. That's where a, a, a district councilman becomes the advocate for the neighborhood that's being flooded and makes sure that the resources are spent on that. And we're, we're facing a, a, a gargantuan battle between drainage and roads and parks and police officers and the stadium. They're two huge chunks of money. And the question is, where do we get it? If there was plenty of money, we could do all the drainage projects right away, but there isn't. And uh, I support the idea of finding those projects that are the worst in the worst situation and making sure that funding is there to build it. So uh, roads and drainage is my second priority below uh, police officers, making sure where our community is safe. Here's the thing, if drainage was a problem 30 years ago, why is it still a problem today? If we had people who were on council 30 years ago that should have fixed the problem, why is it still a problem? 
no matter who it was on the council, it's still an issue that plagues Jacksonville. There were dollars that were committed in River City Renaissance and the Better Jacksonville plan and other plans of this city over and over again. There were bond dollars that were supposedly committed over and over again that did not get addressed. One of the things that I believe that I will do if elected or when elected to the city council is work with district council people to ensure that when those projects in all of our districts are there, they all deserve priority. The dollars are there, it's just how they're allocated. From what I've seen and the, the, the statistics I've looked at and the budgets I've looked at, it's not that the dollars aren't available, it's that the dollars aren't properly allocated. So we have to be uh, uh, very vocal you know, they say the squeaky wheel gets the noise. It's important. I'll tell you very quickly, in my neighborhood, there was a time in the last, uh, uh, during that tra trash crisis uh, last year, literally my neighborhood, my street, we went uh, six weeks with no garbage pickup. Do you hear me? Six weeks. And I kept talking to my district council person over and over. And we live on the west side, John, as you know. So there were muskrats and, and armadillo and possums and all kind of stuff coming out of the woods. And we were trying to band together to get this stuff off of the street. Our district council person did nothing. But what I did is talk to other council people in other areas. And that's what I'll do when you send me to Jacksonville City Council, work together to get stuff done. What, what is a muskrat? Muskrat. That's, that's not the regular rat. The muskrat is the big rat with the can long you, tail. You, can you tell me what a muskrat is? That's the, y'all know what a muskrat is. Anybody from the country know what a muskrat don't, is? Don't, don't See, he know. moves you. He moved up a little bit. Weasel. Yeah. Um... So I live in uh, Springfield and, you know, anywhere you go in this city, you go three or four blocks over, you can go, it looks like a totally different city in many parts, right? Um, and same thing with Springfield. Um, there are uh, some of our neighbors, it rains, not a hard rain, just a light rain. Their road is flooded for three days straight. Why? I am um, um, walking, I've been walking in, in District 8 the last few days um, and canvassing uh, 850 square miles. I'm not going to be able to get to all of it, but I will try my best. And I see all the issues that people are talking about that are affecting their daily lives every single day that are not being handled, right? The streets are flooded, the sidewalks or if there's even sidewalks, right? It's not safe. It's not how we continue to build forward, right? So talking about ROI, the biggest ROI is you get from infrastructure because now that area of the neighborhood can grow at a much better rate and, and have a healthier lifestyle in the long run, right? So again, yes and. But this is my focus. Again, my, where I want to spend our dollars, infrastructure, neighborhoods, and people. Those are the three areas. But we have to make it happen. And all right, thank you. <laughs> so drainage. Drainage is a big, big issue out here in, in District 2. Um, you know, we, we do a drainage project, and then lo and behold, a year later, we got another drainage issue. The problem that we're facing here is that we don't have a strategic plan with our planning department to when a subdivision comes in, uh, they build right by right beside us existing subdivision, they build it two foot higher. Where does all the water go? This subdivision was draining fine, but now they just shoved all the water over here. You go over here, saddle, saddle, uh, saddlewood. The water's perking up underneath the roads. It's not coming from the top because the subdivision beside it is raised higher. So you, when you raise the water table, it hydraulics up underneath it. And see, that's what I'm going to be able to bring to the city council is I am a licensed general contractor. I'm a licensed underground utility contractor and electrical contractor. So I understand infrastructure, civil, and what they're doing and where we're missing it. We just cannot let these developers come in and rubber stamp them, they go out here and build. When we just spent millions on fixing a drainage project, then they just destroy it. So we've got to have a plan of what we're doing and bring it all back into perspective that 
you control your surface water and your water table on each piece of property. Infrastructure for me is another priority. Uh, we, we back up to District 2. So if you know the problems that District 2 has, then you know the problems that District 8 has. And they probably have even more extensive because they've been oh, underfunded in infrastructure for a number of years. So that has to become a priority. And we must make priority of the priorities. So those who have not received the funding for years need to be able to receive more funding just to get to where the people who have received that for infrastructure for years. So I do believe that one, I, I actually was in a, a, a city of Jacksonville resiliency meeting all day last week where we were able to identify where the highest problems were for infrastructure, for, flow, for flooding, for septic tanks. We identified that as, as a group, as city, uh, the new chief resili resiliency officer held, held um, actually held that, that meeting. And so from there, talking about a plan, now we have an, an, an idea of where the biggest issues are. And, and guess where a lot of them were? Northside, Jacksonville. So at that point, we need to be able to have the, the resources follow where the problems are and those problems that have been long overlooked. And so that would be what I would do as a city council person, as your city council person, is to make sure that we know where they are, that we are identifying them, and then bringing the resources to support it. So I have a proposal called Smart Growth. The idea is we utilize older parts of the city where we already have existing infrastructure. We have water and sewer, we have electric, we have roads, and these areas also back up to five potential rail lines where we can utilize commuter rail as the primary source of transportation. All we have to do is to change our land use policy. If we can change the land use policy, the development community will come in they will address the needs of the area through higher density. It will focus the growth in these existing areas. You don't have to add infrastructure. It's already there. Anytime you bring in an add value to real estate where your infrastructure already exists, that tax revenue goes to the bottom line of the city. It doesn't cost, in, the marginal cost is far outweighed by the marginal revenue. And in economics, that's a pretty good situation. So that's the sort of policy that I would introduce. And uh, this would help pull development off of some of the more environmentally sensitive areas like the north side, like some of the outlying areas on the west side and down in my part of Jacksonville on the southeast side. It would pull, it would pull development off of the environmentally sensitive areas along the riverfront. And it doesn't cost anything. We, would, we wouldn't have to have a, a multi-million dollar public works project downtown. We just need to change land use policy. All right. Thank you for those questions. Let's move on to the topic of businesses. Let's talk small business, local businesses. What kind of things do you believe are a barrier to small and local businesses that you believe city council has the power to do something about? I think information is one thing. JSEB is already there, which is something that the city already has where we're dealing with small and emerging businesses in Jacksonville. Uh, however, incentives are always helpful. I do believe that there are opportunities, and I know this is this may not be the most libertarian thing for me to say about giving incentives and tax dollars, so don't beat me up. Tub, I want to be able to get out of here in one piece. But seriously, I think some there are some options of incentives that are really important. Uh, we were all together recently at a forum and one of the things that some of the people talked about is um finding ways to connect with interns and younger people in the community. And although those programs, uh, people talked about them running through the city, I think we've got to do a better job of public-private partnerships, ensuring that we find ways to connect the corporate community with Jacksonville. Um, what that looks like, I don't know specifically, but I think getting there, those incentive programs will be helpful. Uh, specifically on the West side, one of the thing, things I want to do, although not in my district, we have so much land and so much opportunity. Uh, the Cecil Commerce Center is something that is 
really begging for unique kinds of businesses to be there. So not only do I want to work to strengthen the businesses that are in our communities through things that we all come together and come up with, but I also want to look and bring, at bringing innovative businesses into our city. <clears throat> Small businesses really are the lifeblood of the city, of our community, of our economy, right? That is where more people are employed at, in smaller businesses than at, in, in anywhere else, especially here in Jacksonville, because uh, I guess, you know, again, our potential has not been able to bring in lots of big name companies over the years, right? Um, but and, and we do have a lot of good resources uh, here. Um, you know, UNF has a, a program. The chamber has a program. There's there's lots of different types of programs. Um, and I'm with Rockman. I, I do believe in some type of a cent incentive. I'm not saying let's just hand out cold, cold, hard cash to anyone that wants to start a business, right? But I think we can, you know, create a program. Let's help them develop the business plan and, and different things of that nature. Um, I, I, what I, when it comes to starting a small business, I, um, a lot of the main issues, I want to say main issues, one of the big issues for some, especially here, as they're wanting to start their business uh, in, in interior locations when the city, is the building. Many of our buildings are abandoned. They need renovations and things of that nature. So we can look at some type of rev grant process, uh, you know, where you discount future tax revenue after that uh, unit is back online and different programs. But we have to support our small business owners because, again, these are the people that's employing all of us, right? Um, and so the more that we can continue continue to support our small business owners, the more that we will be able to build forward for Jacksonville, make it a better place for everyone. As a city, a city councilman, I would, would be, we've got to put our money where and, and put our action where our mouth is, as simple as that. We've got businesses here that we do nothing as a city for them. We go into, you know, I work all around the Southeast for Georgia, Alabama. When I go into a lot of municipalities, I have to go up and compete against a local business preference that if they're within 10% of, of what my price is, they get the preference over. We do nothing for our people here. We build a courthouse downtown. You know how many local contractors worked on that? One one contractor every bit of that revenue left this city we got to stop just sitting here being lackadaisical and say we want to support small business we want us but we don't have a policy in place that we're going to build a new stadium well we need to have a local business preference in it that we're going to use local businesses we're going to use lo local labor that's going to come first and foremost so that revenue is stays here in the city and we need to implement that policy throughout to where uh, any project, small business, any business, we get a local business preference from anything from janitorial services, whatever, that we sit here and put our people first because that money will stay here and not go somewhere else. See, people of different parties, different colors, different ages can agree on things. I agree with that, <laughs> you know, and that's how you work with people. That, that's a, and that's exactly right. We have to ensure that we are p putting policies in place because as city council persons, that's our job. We are supposed to put the policy in place for the city. So making sure that we're enacting that type of legislation that requires that city projects, city funds go to Jacksonville based businesses. J. <laughs> okay, yes, JCF needs to be funded, it needs to be there, but it needs to work for the small and emerging businesses. That money needs to go to the people who it is intended for, and that has not always been the case. So we need to make sure that we're holding our city departments accountable for the work that they are supposed to do. And we also need to help businesses by have putting money in for technical assistance. It's not always the, 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 the answer. And I do also agree about incentivizing Jacksonville local small businesses. Yes, because we incentivize the big businesses to come into Jacksonville. So we need to give those same type of incentives to our Jacksonville based small businesses. But I also think that technical assistance is so important. I also have a small business and I do business management, management consultant and that and capacity building 
for our small businesses, showing them where resources are is also important. I'll give you an example. There's a, a provision in the city ordinance for something called a certificate of certificate of use. If you are a tenant moving into a multi-tenant retail or office property to start your business, you have to go through a process. It was an onerous process. I am a member of the Northeast Florida Builders Association. I chair the commercial development subcommittee. We sat down and talked to stakeholders. I worked with Danny Becton, whom I hope to succeed on the city council. Me, a Democrat, working with a Republican city council member. For three years, we worked on this legislation. We got to a point, he says, bring me a bill. I drafted a bill. I worked for Charles Bennett. I told you that earlier. He taught me how to write legislation. I wrote the bill. I had it re reviewed by some of our local attorneys. They, they made some tweaks, but we introduced the bill. It passed. It eliminated some of the obstacles for small business formation. That didn't cost any money. It saved the small businesses money. It enabled them to start business while they're in the process of satisfying the information requirements to obtain that certificate of use. That's all we have to do is to work across the aisle, Democrats, Republicans, independents, libertarians, it doesn't matter your party affiliation, local government is about neighbors helping neighbors. Thank you. I agree with Raymond on the idea of reducing the regulation that is the, the regulatory hoops that people have to jump through to have a small business, to open a small business in Jacksonville. But I'm more of a free market guy. I don't like the idea of the city subsidizing small business. We have done some pretty awful things in the past whenever we start giving grant money. And there's one that, I, that pops to mind. We gave a million dollars, one million dollars, to a, uh, a guy who was gonna start a barbecue restaurant and it never opened. We can get in a lot of trouble. We can waste a lot of money when you start trying to subsidize small business. I would say reduce the regulation, you know, make the pathway as smooth as possible, but rely on the free market. If somebody wants to open a business, they have the capital, make it easy but using city tax dollars to subsidize small business uh, ends up causing a lot of problems. Okay, thank you. So now I wanna talk about the vibe of Jacksonville. And what I mean by that is right now in the news, and you're hearing about people that feel they need to leave the state of Florida because of this policy or that policy. Right, there, there are, there's a lot of conversation about whether or not people, any people, uh, are welcome in the state of Florida. So let's bring this back to Jacksonville. Since you've been out on the campaign trail, you've been knocking doors, I believe Mr. Garrison said he was doing that just today. What is your feel? What is the vibe that you're getting from the citizens that you're interacting with here in Jacksonville? And, and let me know if that's not a, not a quick question. What? Uh, the, the vibe of of Jacksonville. Do do is Jacksonville a welcoming city? Uh, city? V vibes a millennial term, John. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> no ageism. <laughs> <laughs> um, Deal. You're you're completely right, and um, I'll start with what I'm hearing, um, and it's it's really refreshing in that um, our neighbors are resilient. And they, they, uh, you know, they have been beaten up and everything else, but they still see the hope for Jacksonville. And that is what we need. Um, early on in my, uh, I wanted to leave Jacksonville myself um, because I didn't feel it was welcoming. I'm gay, right? And so when I was 15 years old, because growing up, I grew up in Middleburg, growing up in Middleburg gay um, and, you know, society telling me who I should be and who I shouldn't be and everything else. Um, at 15 years old, I put a shotgun in my mouth, ready to pull the trigger. Right. And so when I talk about creating a welcoming Jacksonville, that is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that everyone doesn't matter where you come from, what your your beliefs are, anything else. You should be you should feel welcome here in Jacksonville and want to call Jacksonville your home. 
right? So I mean that. I know what it is to not feel welcomed. Um, and we have to support our neighbors. We have to be able to have a conversation. Yes, I'm running as a Democrat, but if I could run as an independent or something else, I would. These parties are tearing us apart. They're turning us versus them. They're creating further left and further right. We need to have a conversation. We need to be able to talk to our friends or talk to our neighbors, not just, you know, oh, I'm a Republican. Oh, don't talk to me. Oh, I'm a Democrat. Oh, you're crazy. No, stop all that. Stop and have a conversation. Thanks. With me growing up in Jacksonville, I've, I've been Mike Gay all my life. <laughs> <laughs> I literally knew that was coming. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's nice. So, yeah, I, you know, you, you, you kind of you kind of get a little <laughs> skin about it, you know. But it's okay to say gay when you vote Mike. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so in our in our city, you know, I say it, it's. We've got a diverse city. We can go from a uh, conservation area out here with uh, wilderness to downtown sidewalks and nothing but concrete. So it, it's we got a, a wide, diverse city. And we have two to 3,000 building residential building permits issued every two to three weeks here in Jacksonville. People are coming. The vibe is, you know, let's let's get to a thriving city. Let's, you know, Jacksonville is, is on the map and things are moving forward. You know, we we've got to come together and and be in one mind and one accord in this city. You know, uh, we've got to stop some of this. Uh, in the campaigns, you see what's going on. I mean, it's it's. I go to the mailbox every day and I find out I'm a different something else about me. You know, I just. <laughs> All my life, I never knew I was this or that. You know, and it's like the, the Eric waving at me. So, <laughs> we just got to come together. We got we got the potential. We can do this. Jacksonville is a growing city, um, but truthfully, it's not welcoming for everybody. But we want to get it there, and we can get it there. So that everybody in Jacksonville, because we're very diverse, very diverse city, that everyone feels that they belong. And how do you do that? You, you bring together people of different parties, different ages, different races, different religions. And you know what? Because I've talked to all of them. We, we're, we were out today canvassing. That's why we, we're dressed like that. That's why I have my fanny pack on. And talking to people. Because, and they all want the same thing. They want a great Jacksonville. They want a great quality of life. They want to live in a safe community and they want to be able to afford to, to feed their families. That's the culture. That's what we want. So we want leaders who understand that and leaders who can bring people together and put away partisan politics like me and Mike just agreed on something. We're going to agree on more things. But that's the culture that we have to bring to Jacksonville. And you do that by being the leaders in Jacksonville to show that it can be done. So it's welcoming. We're gonna make it even more welcoming for everybody so that they feel that they belong. As I walk the neighborhoods of District 11, I knock on every door on my list, whether they're a Republican, a no party affiliation or a Democrat. I hear three things. I wanna have a safe neighborhood, I want to have fiscal responsibility where you're not raising my taxes. And then I want to have smart growth where we're not overcrowded with our transportation arteries. I don't hear any concerns about not allowing African Americans, not allowing Asian Americans, not allowing Hispanic Americans. I hear nothing about the woke culture. I hear nothing about anything that is embedded in prejudice or racism. I hear a, a community that just wants to live in the greatest city in the United States. We have the best climate. We have a, a beautiful ocean front, you know, to the east of us along the Atlantic Ocean. We have this beautiful river that goes through the heart of downtown. That's what unites the people of Jacksonville. That river is not a division point it becomes a way for us to build bridges from one side of the river to the other. 
The river unites us. It does not divide us. And that's what I hear. The citizens of this area just want to have a city government that will work for them because they want members of the city council to work with each other. <clears throat> yes, I'll say when I have walked door to door and talked to uh, residents around District 14, I don't hear any of that stuff. All I hear is, you know, when are you going to make sure the restroom at the athletic field is fixed? It's been six months and it hasn't worked. Or when are you going to widen Old Middleburg Road? Or when are you going to uh, uh, make sure Rampart Road isn't completely overrun? How did we get uh, uh, 400 new apartments on an intersection that the, the traffic engineer said has already failed? How did that happen? They don't, they don't pay attention to these other issues. Everyone, especially in, in the growing part of District 14, is, is just interested in a quality of life. And they don't feel, I, I've got all races. I've talked to all different kinds of people. They just want a quality of life. They want to be able to get to work, without taking two hours, get home without taking two hours, and feel safe in their neighborhoods. So I, those are the meat and potatoes issues that city council needs to deal with. Thank you. I think the vibe of District 14 and the vibe of Jacksonville is just that, a vibe. May 26th will be my birthday, so I'm gonna start celebrating early since it's almost May, hey, hey. And I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to the Jazz Festival. And one of the beautiful things I've seen about the Jazz Festival, especially coming from someone who has spent a career in the arts and in media, is that there's such a cross-section of people at the Jazz Festival on, on the front of the river uh, and down at the other stage by the Hyatt. I mean, black folk, white folk, candy stripe folk, whoever you know, they are all there having a good time. This year, I'm looking forward to going and enjoy my birthday, listening to the sounds of Shaka Khan. And I, I'm so excited. And I can't tell you how many times in the last uh, 10 years that I've gone to this new iteration. I remember as a kid going to Mayport and all that jazz. And I know I'm telling my age when I say Mayport and all that jazz. That was, that was like the 80s, 70s and 80s. But this new iteration of what the Jazz Festival has become is a microcosm of what Jacksonville is. It's a place where we can all enjoy different music and different ways of, of culture, but we can all come together not as a, a melting pot, but as a salad bowl. Each and every one of those diverse flavors in that salad bowl comes through when we take a bite, and that's what I see in my city. So the vibe is growth, the vibe is development, but the vibe is also connection, and that's important. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> we're getting there and uh thank you for those answers you know and it sounds like uh you know it sounds promising um you know it makes me feel really good about jacksonville at this point of the meeting what we're going to do is listen to the rain but we're also going to hand things over to tub tub is going to float around into the audience and so audience members if you have a question here's what i would like you to do just kind of wave at tub he will come over to you and have your question ready and I want you to do two things. Make your question brief, really quick, so don't spend a long time, you know, well, back when I, no long story, please. And then if it's for all of the candidates, then say so. If it's for a specific candidate, then also say that as well. So I'm gonna hand this over to Tub, and we'll go from there. I think the only thing I will add to that is I have a chance to follow up a question with you. Like you answer something like, oh, whoa, hang on. I have that, we have a few seconds to go through that, and you cheated. You gave a Shaka Khan reference, dude. You can that. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll start with anybody have a question that they want to ask? For? We'll start. Okay. Who, who, who's it to? Okay. Not to for everyone. Okay. Uh, what are the top three forms of uh, the city spending that you would cut because they are a waste or they are totally uh, counterproductive? Do you mind, uh, so what we will cut and because of what now, I'm sorry? Let me get closer because of the sound of the rain. Yeah, just hold a little yes. bit. 
three forms, the top three forms of city spending that you would cut because it's wasteful or counterproductive. Thank you. One of the one of the main things that we need to do in our city to bring things back into perspective is we've got a wasteful uh, spending mindset that we have with these nonprofits. We got to go back to effective spending with our nonprofits. And what happens now is these council people sit on the boards of these nonprofits making six healthy figures, passing out millions of dollars to the nonprofits. We need to go back to a vetting process of the nonprofits to the ones that actually are doing the work that needs the money to set for the community. And so by bringing that back in perspective, we, we can sit here and actually save money, but also have extra money to take care of other needs in the city. And it's, you know, I don't know if y'all remember a few, uh, a few months back, they had a city council meeting that had excess COVID money and the, they waited to the two minute drill, the council meeting at the very last, and they were just throwing money out left and right. And, and it was not, nothing, they waived the, the vetting process and all these nonprofits were money that were being received, councilmen set on the boards making six figures. So that's, that's the, the first thing that we'll do. We will re, re go to go back to purchasing and we will change our purchasing codes because we got an ODP process that we could be capitalizing on to where the city is not saving money on our tax exempt status and that's only two but that, that's the main one that we'll be able to capture so much money out of our capital spending that we are just lackadaisical not getting well now we're now we're back to disagreeing sorry right, hello hello I'm a, I'm a non-profit person right but we don't not totally disagree mike because uh my opponent received some of that money <laughs> uh, and that was with unvetted, received some of that money. And, but I, so I agree with that. But the nonprofits are out here doing some great work. But the part that I do agree, agree about, and again, I work for a nonprofit, but guess what? My money doesn't come from the city. We do not receive any money from the city. And in fact, Elder Source funds the city for their senior services. So my thing would be that we need to look at the councilmen and the council persons and these pet projects. They begin to get dollars, they get dollars to them, and they're able to give money for the pet projects that they have in their district. And that doesn't mean that it's going to some useful, something useful for the city of Jacksonville. It's going to someone's friend. And are we following up on that money? I can assure you that we're not. So what I would do is, as it relates to cut, looking at the waste and, and um, uh, you know, unfettered resources that we have, is to go to those pet projects and even the pet projects of the administration to make sure they are indeed working projects for the city of Jacksonville and not someone's friend. Well, I would start. I'm not sure this is. Got, I would start. I would start by uh, fully staffing the sheriff's office. With a fully staffed sheriff's office, we don't have to pay overtime at time and a half. So we would immediately, by hiring more positions, we would immediately save 30% right off the top. Okay? That's, that extra overtime money could be utilized for other things for public safety. Another thing I would look at, travel. Do city council members need to travel on these junkets to go to the Paris air show? Do they need to go to London to watch the Jaguars play? Okay. So I, I would start looking at city travel expenses and conferences. City uh, staffers with, in this day and age of you know virtual meetings, we don't need to go to real in-person meetings and conferences. So those are some things that they may seem small, but they can yield great dividends in terms of savings to the city budget. 
That one is better. <laughs> well, I spent two years on the Finance Committee. It was a long time ago, but there was a lot of waste back then. And I mentioned one today. I mentioned a million dollars for a barbecue restaurant that never opened. That's, that's an obvious place to, to cut. Uh, just the city should not be in the business of funding restaurants. Uh, and also things like um, the, the, the stadium. I know, of course, I know we're going to have to spend a lot of money on the stadium, but <laughs> it, it's tough. Things like land banking. I had, there was a lot of money spent on just buying land. And, and then, you know, when it comes to the nonprofits, they all have a story. Every project has someone who is an advocate for that project. And it will be the end of the earth if they don't get their money. That's where it becomes tough to, to, to cut. But we need to make those tough decisions. Don't waste money. The, the last one, there's two right there, the Skyway Express. The Skyway Express is... is <laughs> That's been my pet peeve now for 30 years. Uh, it started with Tommy Azuri, and every time I say the thing is a complete failure, I'm told we can't stop it because the government, the federal government will want its money back. And I don't believe that for a minute. We should not spend another dime on the Skyway Express. You know, we got to talk in reality here a little bit, my friends. Uh, number one, there's some of the things that have been set up here that just don't even make good nonsense. First of all, I don't know. I've served on nonprofit boards all my life, and I never got a six-figure salary from any of the nonprofit boards I've served on. So the nonprofit boards I know specifically here in Jacksonville that have gotten dollars do not get the people who sit on the boards do not get paid. Not here in Jacksonville, Florida. I think what people are, are meaning to say is that their chief executive officers may have gotten paid, but the boards themselves, the people at those organizations don't get paid. And let me say why, I, why I'm upset with that or why I take umbrage to that is the fact that I want city council members serving on nonprofit boards. I want them being a part of this community and diverse organizations. Those are things we want. So I got to refute that. I'm going to use my time to do that. Secondly, we I keep hearing, I got to say it, John, I know you mean well, but I don't know what this million dollars you're talking about is for a barbecue restaurant that never opened. I'm going to assume you're talking about Jerome Brown barbecue. If, if I'm going to assume that you... If I'm going to assume that you're talking about that, it was a $590,000 loan that the city provided that was guaranteed, meaning that if you default on the loan, what happens? You got to pay it back. They come get you. And so we need to make sure that programs, and I'm going to get to answer the question in just a moment, but we got to make sure that programs that are there are utilized for everybody in the community and can be. And we were talking about barbecue sauce, not a barbecue restaurant. That's that. Last but not least, I am not going to walk into this office. It would be fiscally irresponsible for me to walk on to city council talking about what I'm going to cut. And I ain't even seen what we got there yet. I think it's important for us to go on the city council with intelligence, look at the budget, look at what's there, look at what's necessary, but not walk in with a slicing switch to cut stuff when we know that Jacksonville needs things like we just talked about moments ago, such as drainage. And by the way, the Skyway money came from the federal government, not from city tax dollars. The original money. Regardless, it still came yeah, from federal. Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. <laughs> All right, but tell the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. I'll just, I'll just be over here, guys. There we go. Mr. Garrison, go ahead. Thank you, Tub. I appreciate that, sir. Uh, former opponent, Tub, great guy. All right. Well, well, I mean, I'm a Democrat, so but you know, don't, don't associate. Then no, I'm just kidding. With, um, all right. Rockman, well, I, mean, I think you're right in that. I mean, I was, thank God I'm, I'm going last because I was trying to rack my brain, um, like, what to cut. And it's, it's not what I, how I approach life of what to take away. And, and yes, no one's for wasteful spending. I mean, but um, 
you know, I would say yes. Uh, the the whole shenanigans with the um, the CARES Act dollars uh, and the the the, the last minute grabs from council members that did not feel right. That didn't look right. Um, the the Skyway. God, that is a mess and a half. Um, but sorry, John. Yes, if we don't, I'm not saying we have to spend a, a lot of money on it, but if we don't keep it up and keep it running, we do owe uh, the federal government just over $200 million. It's called a contract. You have to, you know, you, you, we're held to it. So, um, you know, I would love to talk to you afterwards and hear your thoughts because you definitely, this question is coming from a place that you do have some thoughts. I would love to hear those. Um, but beyond what I'd said, I don't really have any other kind of major thoughts of what I want to cut right away. All right, we're going to go right here. Eric, if we can, we're going to let, we're going to bring your responses down to one minute, if that's okay. Okay. Mine is quick. It's just being a, uh, it's just Mr. Day, I think. Being a former police officer, I served 25 years. When, when I started on the department, we were over 200 positions down on the street and over 170 something positions down in the jail. That, when I left the department, we're where you're at now. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to figure out where are we gonna find this money to fund this? For, because they couldn't do it in the 25 years I worked there. And, Cause I sure would like to see it because I wanna see that help go to some of my brothers and sisters that are still out there on the front line. It's very easy, actually. Find, I'm sorry. And last, where do I find your plan? It's very easy, actually, because in the current fiscal year, the city of Jacksonville generated $95 million in marginal ad valorem tax revenue. This means new ad valorem tax revenue that was generated as a result in the growth of our tax base. This is not an increase in the millage rate. If you remember, in the current budget, we actually, the city council actually cut the millage rate by one eighth of a mill. It went from 11.44 mills to 11.31 mills. That $95 million, it would take about 17% of that $95 million every year to fund the, uh, to fully fund the police over this eight year time frame. It comes out of current revenue. It doesn't come from new taxes. All right, and then the second part of your question was where do you find it? Okay, uh, the, the, the details are found on the uh, True Commission website from the August 2nd, 2022 minutes of that meeting. My, it's about a two page proposal that was adopted by the True Commission. And then there was a follow-up resolution adopted, I believe in September of 2022. Next up. Listen, don't be giving them something easy just because I should be wearing a shirt, all right? <laughs> Who's the two? Uh, actually, this one's to everyone but Mr. Day, um, because his district doesn't touch the water. Um, I, um, Jacksonville needs a new bridge. We either need a new bridge or we need to widen some of the bridges. Would you support either adding a new bridge? You know, I think some one of them might have to cross over in the district, you know, be district two. The other one may be district 14. Um, so would you support, a, you know, a new bridge or maybe even a tunnel to help ease some of the you know, traffic on the bridges that we have now? Oh, nobody wants to just jump on that one. So, I would, I'm, I'm, oh, oh go ahead, Tamika. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Start, I'm yeah. sorry. They know it was okay. Cool. Um, well, one, like I said, I start, I was, uh, no, sorry about it. I was set on the um, resiliency committee just last week, and we were looking at different um, ways to put in new infrastructure. What I would say is that I want to be able to alleviate the challenges that we have. Is that answer a new bridge? I don't know. But I have smart people around me, those that that know where, you know, what what type of alternatives we have to be able to address that issue that bring those, that information back so that we can take a look at it. We're starting to do that. I can tell you to tell you that based upon the, the months and months of work that we've done around that issue to be able to ensure that Jacksonville is safe for people to travel around the city. So would I support that? If that is the best option brought back from the information that we receive, uh, absolutely. But I would want to make sure that we do our due diligence and research that before I give you a yes, I would do that. Mr. Draper. <laughs> Uh, the 
best place, and, and the, the idea has been floated for uh, 30 years, is a new uh, Matthews Bridge, the orange one. It is, dates back 70 years, and it needs it. But that's at least a billion dollars to replace that bridge. It's uh, the old Erector Set style bridge. So to build a new bridge across the river at that point would cost a lot of money. But I think you might be able to garner the support for that. Building a bridge across uh, Timaquana over, over to uh, where J. Turner Butler is, that's been floated before and is, there's a great deal of opposition to that. Um, I think if we're going to improve the, the uh, you know, pick a bridge to improve, it would be the Matthews Bridge. Yes. <laughs> we want to ride, ride around Jacksonville. Long, that's the short answer. Yes, we need to do whatever we can to continue to make Jacksonville accessible. Yes. Uh, not a tunnel. I mean, we don't. That's way expensive. I mean, come on now. <laughs> calm, calm down. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, but uh, put to, I'll be very honest. I have not heard anyone. This is the very first time I've heard anyone say, "Hey, we need a new bridge." Um, but that's that's just me, right? Um, but one good thing is a lot of that money is going to come from Florida and that's, and also from um, the federal government. Um, and, you know, so that is one good thing is we won't be covering that full billion dollar cost or whatever it ended up being. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it's needed, if it's needed, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm all for progress, but you know, progress with, the purpose, the purpose of the people that we get, we, you know, we get our grants, we get our federal support and what is, you know, the needs that we have for the, the citizens and our thoroughfares that, that yes, we're growing and we're, you know, even out here on the north side, 2003, the Better Jacks was supposed to take care of Center Drive all the way to Alta Road. And if you drive that road now, it, it never happened. Jacksonville got better, but it didn't get better out here. So, you know, we, we need to go back and if we're going to do something like that, we need to follow through to make sure we got the insurance and the, and the assurance that it's going to be done. Okay. In the interest of time, we're going to do one more question. If it's for everybody. Okay. And, and then if, does anybody have a question for any one individual candidate? Mr. Johnson, my name is Melina Gay. I just heard you say something, and then I'm glad you said it because I think there's really a big misunderstanding here. Did you say that sitting on the board of the nonprofits that it's nonsense that those people aren't making six figures? No, that that's not that's not what I said. Okay. So when Mr. Gay said that members of the boards of the nonprofits were making six figures, that was what I took umbrage with. Okay. So not the executives that run the nonprofits. No, I because I would represent well, what, you. What I was I'm, referring I'm, to was the council members. Yeah. Who were, right, council members who were sitting on the boards. I want to differentiate what you said was those who sit on the boards. I think what you meant was that those who were CEOs of those organizations. The, the affiliated, we get the correct. No, we can, but we can't say affiliated because there are people, again, I've sat on boards most of my career well, as somebody who's been an figure, executive. They can six figure however they want to. How you want to slice and dice it? I, I need, I need to, I need a point. No, I just want to point it out, and I'm going to. She wanted clarification of the question. Yes, That's yes. important. And, and I'm not being argumentative. I'm just trying to make sure that we're on the same page because yes. it, it is a problem. And what I wanted to bring up to you is that Reggie Gaffney, Aaron Bowman, Jacoby Pittman, Kevin Carrico, Michael Boylan, Nick Howland, Terrence Freeman, and Rory Diamond have all sat on the boards, and maybe. The, the exception of Rory Diamond being a CEO, they are currently er earning six figures or more from the nonprofits that are funded by the city of Jacksonville. Well, you're incorrect, though. No, you can see it on their financial. L disclosure. Listen, let me explain where you're incorrect. I got to push back because you're not giving correct information. You are talking about executives on the boards versus board members. Mike said executive of the organizations. Thank you for the correction. Mike, you said board members, 
right? And, and, I, and I, Mike, I'm a big fan of yours, and you know that, but I got to make sure that we say this right. Board members are there as volunteers. How do they have the six figures? Because they have jobs, right? I am, I, I've been a news anchor reporter. I worked on Nickelodeon. I have a small business. I'm, I'm involved in corporate America. My dollars that I make from money, that's one of the reasons when you go on the board, they say, how much can you give when you come on the board? So I've been on many boards across the country and not once did I get a salary from those boards, unlike corporate boards. What I'm talking about here is we need to differ differentiate between executives like vice presidents, those people that you named didn't get a dollar for being on a board. They got money for being an employee of the organization. And that's what I want to differentiate. So you're saying that Kenny Carapel, for example, is an employee of the Boys yes, and Girls he's, Club. Yes. He is. He is he's the, the vice president. He's the vice president. He's not on the board. Of, of, of Boys and Girls Club, CEO Jacoby Pittman of uh, White, White Mission. C oh, Yes. yes, but yes. make sure because you that money. Yes, because but that money goes to the organization, and those individuals get paid from, from the organization. But let's make so, sure we specify that because this is Mike. But yeah. no, 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 no. Listen, hang on, hang on. We got to make sure that we hold on. No, because this is something that this we have had this conversation before. We got to specify executives versus board members. And Mike, I want to make sure that we understand that I because. Ms. Shaw, I actually, to be honest with you, this is where we're going to end this here. We're not debating each other on this one. Okay. But I will tell you, I don't think you're that far off. I'm on this side. I think you're kind of saying the same we thing. Are. You're mixing yeah. languages all this. Right. Yeah. We are. Yeah. I think so, that's all so, it is. So, yes, we are. So, I, you know, I, I sit on boards. Let me say that. But I also am the chief operations officer of a nonprofit that doesn't get money from the city. Let's make let's make sure that's clear. That doesn't get money from the city. So what I believe this conversation is saying is that if you are if you are making a decision to allocate money to your employer, because you can't determine where that money goes That's or where it doesn't saying. go, then you should not be able to make those and get those dollars. I think that is yes. what we're in yes. That's inclusively exactly what saying, saying yes. for a year now. It's the same, you're actually saying the same thing. And just to be clear, and they are, well, right my now, opponent yeah. is one of those individuals yep. who receives oh. money <laughs> from the city but of But you should recuse yourself. You should recuse yourself. All right, so we... have a conflict that, 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 that's exactly that's what this all turns into. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hold that's on. Wait a minute. And let's. Let's. Oh, hang on. We've already cleared this. We're done. Yeah. We're done. You can listen. You can arm wrestle after and settle this out. All right. You need to make sure so, that it's said. And I, but that's what I'm saying. I think that's what it is. I think it's just words. It's we're we we're, we're yeah. quibbling we over words. Mean things. Oh yeah. But I think that what is we're good. I think we're all moving in the same direction. Okay. So we are at the time of wrapping up. So you will now have a minute and fifteen seconds. Min oh, <laughs> man, the man with the timer said one minute, one minute to wrap it all up. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you all for all being here tonight. You know, it, it, it coming to these forums. It's always good to see people that care about our city, that are concerned about our city. And I applaud you for being here to take an interest in our community. And we need more patriots like you that will step up and say, what is going on? I want to be informed. And when we're down that city council after we're, we're elected and, you know, something's coming up, we need you. We need you to come in and be a voice and support the will of the people. And that, that's, I'm not here for a new career. I'm not here for a new bucket or a bucket list or a plaque on the wall. I'm here with the people of Jacksonville to be a, sit, to be a voice for the people. I'm Mike Gay, city council, district two, a vote for me the vote for you. Thank you. Yes, thank you again for coming out and to listen to us share our plan, share who we are, share what we would like to do for the city of Jacksonville. I'm Tamika Gaines Holly, candidate for City Council District 8, and I've said this on I don't know how many different forums. You have to be accessible to the people. The people up here decided to come out here so they could engage each one of you so that you know who they are, they are and what we, want, what we want to do. And there are some people who are not represented up here. So we got to take notice of that because the, the way you campaign is the way you will do your job one, if you're elected, which I hope no one that's on the stage, at least for District 8, will not be elected by you guys that's at least here. 
I'm just going to put it out there. But so what I'm saying is that I want to make sure that you have a candidate on the ballot for District 8 that's going to bring change, needed change, to a community that has been for decades overlooked. Someone who's going to be courageous and someone that's going to be able to respond to your needs. So I'm Raymond Day, candidate for City Council in District 11. I am running to represent every single voter, every single resident in District 11. I don't care what your nationality, what your race, what your political affiliation is. I don't care if you have lived in Jacksonville for 80 years or 80 days. I want to represent every single person in District 11 and I will use my best effort to make the conscientious decisions that need to be made for the entire city of Jacksonville, serving as the representative of District 11. Thank you. I'm John Draper. I'm running for the Jacksonville City Council District 14. I'm a former Jacksonville City Councilman from the southwest part of Jacksonville. I'm a Navy veteran and a small business owner. I have the experience, I know how it works, but I wanna make sure that the city government focuses on neighborhood issues, on getting the things that really matter to individuals, individual neighborhoods, make sure they're not stomped on by bad rezoning, make sure they get the roads they were promised. We were, prom we were promised Old Middleburg Road out of the better Jacksonville plan we never got. I wanna make sure that that doesn't happen again. We must focus on the bread and butter, meat and potatoes issue as a district councilman. I will do that. I'm John Draper, thank you. A brilliant man by the name of Bernard Gregory once said, and you might know Bernard Gregory in this city, said, if you do what you always did, you are gonna get what you always got. I want to do something different. It's about progress. Even in a relay race, when you are running with the baton, it's important for you to pass the baton. If you do not pass the baton to the next person, you are then disqualified from the relay race. I tell you all those things to say, I'm ready to take the baton and move forward. As somebody who, though I haven't been on city council, has served as an elected official, has been a storyteller, has been someone who has told your stories on television throughout the country and around the world, one thing I know is I'm ready to elevate your voices on Jacksonville City Council. I'm ready to tell your stories and get to work for you. So please, even if you're not in my district, pass the word, vote for Rachman Johnson, a vote for progress. I'm looking forward to get to work for you on Jacksonville City Council. Thank you. Jacksonville is on a precipice, as I see it. We can continue on the same path that we have been for the last umpteen years, or we can continue to move forward. I am doing this because I'm tired. I'm tired of driving by and seeing something that was going to happen and didn't happen. I'm tired of going or not having anything to do unless it's downtown at a specific time frame or if it's over here. And we, I'm, we've been lied to for years and years and years. Now, ultimately, yeah, all of us up here, we could be telling you a story and then, you know, uh, you just have to wait for it for four years. But no, everyone up here is up here because they're passionate for Jacksonville. They love the city that we live in, right? Um, and I'm tired of the good old boy club. I'm tired of the, uh, the, the same people that have been doing the same stuff for years and years and years. And my opponent, I'm, I'm, thank you, Eric, I'm almost done. My opponent, Chris Miller, works for John Rutherford. And that is the good old boy club, right? So at the very least, if you don't like me, vote against him, all right? <laughs> All right. All right. I want to thank everybody for coming out.